Mm. Lord Fowler, a um, number of questions um, proposed by core participants. Um, so they're going to leap around from subject to yeah. subject rather than um, be, be, be thematic. Um, first is this, in relation to the uh, uh, position of Dr. Gal Gray, um, who, as you'll recall, wrote that, that report with a recommendation addressed to Dr. Field in, in May of 1983. Um, you, you referred on a number of occasions during your evidence to Dr. Galbraith being just one man. Um, however, Dr. Galbraith was, in fact, the director of uh, the uh, Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre, a governmental body with responsibility at the national level for prevention and control of infectious disease. Would you accept, therefore, that he was someone whose view ought to have carried significant weight in the department's decision-making process. Yes, and I think he did. Um, I don't in any way uh, denigrate uh, Dr. Galbraith, who, who um, had a high reputation and was obviously a very uh, a distinguished um, medical man. No question of that whatsoever. Uh, the, I think the, the question was whether his one decision was going to be the thing which determined policy. And I... Uh, we came to the conclusion that it would be better to uh, wait until there was a more collective view uh, on that subject. Um, now, the next question um, will be assisted if we look at a passage from Lord Glenarch's evidence. And I'm, I, I don't know if it's a passage that you've looked at before, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. Thank you. INQY 1000139, please show me. Um, and then if we go to, um, it's page 145 of the uh, internal pagination. So if we try, um, I don't know, page 35 or something electronically and see where that takes us to. If we go on a couple of pages. That's it. If we look at the top half of the page, please. So I'm going to read out a passage from Lord Glenarth's evidence, um, Lord Fowler, but ju ju just before I do so, to put it in context, what I was asking Lord Glenarth about at this point in his evidence was the decision-making process in 1983 weighing the risks of AIDS on the one hand against the risks to haemophiliacs in relation to non-use of factor concentrates on the other. Um, and uh, um, if we... Pick it up at line 12 on the left-hand side. Um, uh, um, uh, so uh, that was one side of the balance you put, or you described being put on the other side of the balance, the risk of haemophiliacs from AIDS. I think that should be the risk to haemophiliacs from AIDS. Yes, which was described to you in the various materials we've looked at as small or sometimes very small. And then the question, it doesn't appear that the risk from non-A, non-B hepatitis, which itself could be fatal either in the short term or the longer term was put into the balance at that point. In other, and then if we can go to the top of the right-hand side, in other words, you weren't just dealing with what was believed rightly or wrongly to be a small risk of infection with AIDS. You were also dealing with a very high risk. Some describe it as a near inevitability of infection with non-A, non-B hepatitis. Now, I should say in the interest of fairness, non-A, non-B hepatitis is also a significant problem in terms of the domestic blood supply. And then this question, do you know why in undertaking that balance the issue of non-A, non-B hepatitis does not appear to have been factored in in the department's decision-making process, specifically in 1983 I'm talking about? Lord Glenarth's answer, no, I don't know, and I'm quite surprised that it wasn't flagged up, for example, in the first briefing I had from Dr. Wolf, or highlighted in some way. I can't recall without looking at it whether or not it was referred to it at all, but, you know, if it was so serious then I'm quite surprised it wasn't flagged up. So th that's the passage from Lord Glenarth's evidence, um, looking at the issue of whether in 1983, the, 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 as it were, the, the question that was being asked was incomplete because it looked at AIDS rather than AIDS plus non-A, non-B hepatitis on one side of the balance. Do, do you have any, any reflection on, on that? Or do, do, are you able to assist us in understanding why non-A, non-B hepatitis wasn't part of the explicit decision-making process um, in, in 1983? I don't, I'm afraid. Uh, I can't really help you very much more than uh, um, Simon Glenarthur has on that, uh, which isn't very far. Um, 
it was not something which uh, um, came to me in any event. Uh, so it was uh, it's difficult for me uh, uh, to judge. I can, by all means, make inquiries about that and see if there's anything I can add to that. But at the moment, I really can't. And that we can take that down, thank you. I think you told us yesterday when, when um, I was asking you about the information that you, you had as Secretary of State. Um, you, you mentioned a, a, a knowledge as the 80s went on that hepatitis was potentially serious. Yeah. Are you able to elaborate at all as to how your knowledge of, of, of the seriousness of hepatitis developed? Well, over the 1980s. Over the 1980s? Um, uh, not really. I, it, it, it developed to some extent, but I mean, it, I was, uh, I was um, almost totally concentrating on HIV throughout the, 19, throughout the 1980s. Um, and then... Um, yeah. I mean, that would, that would not have been the case in the... I hope in the uh, medical division, uh, but you know that was the medical division was just one part of this enormous DHSS empire. Um, and then I, I asked you yesterday um, about uh, um, whether you'd have been concerned if the department was relying largely on the opinion of a single haematology expert. And I think we, my, it was my fault, Lord. Lord um, Lord Fowler, because I didn't then follow through the question with you. I think um, there may have been a degree of confusion as to who I was referring to. It, it may be submitted to, to the inquiry um, that the department was over-reliant upon the evidence of a, a particular haemophilia clinician, Professor Bloom. I, I'm not asking you to comment on that as a matter of fact, because I don't think that's something you had direct involvement with. Um, but it, if it were the case that the department was largely or entirely taking its advice about haemophilia care from one clinician, would that concern you as a matter of, of, of the department's decision-making process? Yes, I do think it would have been good practice, and I think it would have concerned the uh, chief medical officer as well, and he would have wished to uh, uh, prevent that. Um, and there's no point in me arguing against one person, uh, you know, however distinguished, uh, saying you, know, you can't just take his view, uh, you've got to take a rather more um, consensus, collective uh, view uh, than that. And that my answer would be uh, the same for both. Um, and then picking up on the issue of the, the chief medical officer, and you, you, you've d described the contrast between Sir Henry Yellow yeah. and Sir Donald Atchison. Um, um, can you assist more generally with what the process was for appointing a chief medical officer? It's a very, very good question. I'm not sure that I can, really. I can't remember uh, how, that was, uh, how that was done. Um, I think it was probably done um, as a uh, civil service appointment, just as you would appoint the permanent secretary, because that's, in effect, what they were. I mean, I sometimes said I had two permanent secretaries. Actually, I had three. I had uh, the uh, permanent secretary, uh, Ken Stowe, then I had the one for Social Security, uh, Geoffrey Otten, and then, of course, I, I, I had Donald, who was the chief medical officer. I think I'm right in saying that that would be done, uh, that would be uh, uh, an appointment uh, carried out in the normal, uh, normal civil service way, although obviously it didn't rise very much. I can check that, but I think that's my reply. And if there were con once a chief medical officer was imposed, if there were concerns about how that chief medical officer was was discharging their responsibilities, were there any mechanisms for addressing that? I think it's always quite difficult to uh, uh, move on uh, someone you're not satisfied with, and rightly so, because you you know we're politicians, we come in, um, and you don't want a political civil service uh, in the sense that. Uh, um, you know, a guy comes in from uh, Conservatives and takes one view, and then from Labour uh, takes another view, um, which has practically nothing to do uh, with their professional capabilities. Uh, it is very difficult to, to move uh, senior uh, civil servants, and is very, very rarely done, in, in my experience. It's perhaps been done more in recent years, and certainly uh, in, in my period in the 1980s. So... Um, uh, and as with Hen for Henry Yellowleaf, I don't think we would have, have thought of doing that because he had been there uh, uh, for some time uh, before I arrived. So in a sense, he was more experienced than, than, than I was. 
wasn't his experience that I was worried about. It was his um, 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 energy, I think, in going into uh, uh, into into the public health e into the public health area. I don't think. I mean, I, looking back on it, I don't think that would be remotely um, a, a good reason for moving him out. Um, and as it happened, we had uh, uh, Donald uh, Aitchison uh, behind, and um, then he then he took over from that. I think it's quite a good idea not to actually have sudden changes, which might look as though they're on a political whim. Um, uh, we, we, we have a non-political civil service, and the, remember that uh, the medical division is part of the civil service, um, and I think we should keep to that. And in 1983, 84, um, um, or, or indeed, in fact, earlier than that, 1981, really, through, through to the mid-1980s, were you aware that um, factor concentrates imported from the U.S.? Um, were made or may have been made using what, what's sometimes referred to as, as either skid row donations or donations from um, prisoners in American prisons. Yes, I learned that as I, as I went along. So but that was I mean, I don't know at what point I learned it. But that was something that was well known within the government. I think, oh, yes, it was well known within the department and well known within the, uh, particularly within the uh, health division, no question. And then, moving to a di an entirely different topic, you, when we were looking at the public education campaign yeah. the issue of stigma um, earlier today, I drew attention to those passages in your uh, uh, statement in which you identified individuals who had expressed views that might be said to be, amongst other things, hostile to the gay community. Very hostile. Um, did, did, did the Prime Minister, as far as you know, share those views? Um... I don't. I hope. I don't think so. Um, I think she had a certain. She had a certain amount of sympathy. I think. I, mean, I never, never really discovered this. Uh, with the uh, chief rabbi, who had a, uh, who had a long criticism um, um, of the campaign, but that was mainly on the grounds that we were, um, we were running the wrong campaign. We should be running a moral campaign. We should be teaching people about um, uh, morality and what we were doing was, in fact, teaching them, I forget the phrase he used, but uh, teaching them how to avoid uh, being um, 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 taken to law um, uh, and, and how to avoid that by using protective clothing. I mean, it was, it was that kind of uh, um, view uh, that uh, that uh, he Rabinowitz, Rabinowitz had, I think he I think he was quite close to the prime minister uh, on that. But she never, to be fair, she never actually talked to me about it, except this view that kept on coming out um, that um, um, if we ran a public health campaign, we were going to uh, we were a kind of public health campaign. Uh, we were going to teach uh, children. Uh, and young people, things that they had never dreamt of. And, um, uh, you know, you pay your money and takes your choice on that, but it seems to me not a very strong, uh, not a very strong argument, and not backed up with any evidence uh, that it led to the kind of consequences that she was fearing, uh, which I assume uh, was that there would be, be an increase. There wasn't an increase, and nor was there any evidence of, of, of it being an encouragement um, now, I just want to ask you a little about, in quite general terms, about your witness statement and some of the, doc the documents referred to in that. Uh, in answering my question, I'm, I'm not asking you to go into the content of discussions yeah. that you may have had with your legal, um, your legal uh, team. Um, I, I, as we've explored in the course of your evidence over the last two days, um, in the period up until 1985, you had comparatively limited direct involvement with matters relating to blood, blood products, he hepatitis or, 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 or HIV. Um, um, but, but you've set out in your statement a, a number of documents which you wouldn't have seen, I think, at the time, and we've tried to um, make that clear as, as, as you've gone through your evidence. Um, would it be right to understand that... Um, oh, sorry. 
Did you go through those documents yourself and, and put together the narrative, or, or, or was that undertaken with the assistance of your legal team? Sorry, the narrative... The of... narrative in your statement of matters in, of which you had no direct involvement at the time. Ah, um, it was a, mi a mixture, but uh, my legal team certainly helped. In terms of those documents that you've referred to, and there are obviously a very large number that you've referred to in your witness statement, um, uh, uh, and which you've commented on, uh, on a number of occasions, have you yourself, for the purpose of preparing and signing your statement, reviewed those documents? I think I probably reviewed all the evidence that we've uh, reviewed all the documents that we've put in. Yes. Um, um, and where you've made observations about matters that you didn't know at the time, that's your perspective being asked about it for the first time. Some forty. Yes, years. and there is a difficulty here because, uh, as I said uh, during the uh, the hearing, it is quite difficult to distinguish uh, between what you knew then and what you know now. Uh, 40 years on. I mean, it is the difficulty uh, with this um, inquiry. I was try to distinguish uh, between the two, but it's not always possible to do. Um, ben, again, going back to some of the general observations you made about, about some of the uh, um, difficulties facing a, a Secretary of State for, for Health in the 1980s, you, you mentioned it could be a rough ride on health in the context of dealing with the, the Prime Minister. Um, can you just elaborate on what, what you mean by that, um, in, in particular by reference to any matters that the inquiry is investigating? I'm not sure how relevant it is to the, the inquiry in the sense of uh, having direct influence, but I mean, <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher always wanted um, uh, some sort of solution uh, to the financial issues of the National Health Service. And uh, I think she had a, um, um, a longing uh, for a, if you like, an insurance-based system of some kind. Um, the trouble, of course, with the insurance-based system was that you then had a two-tier uh, health system, and we, we, it, it never, we never, um, we never pursued that. Although uh, Patrick, my predecessor, did do a certain amount of work looking at alternative health systems. <clears throat> it was she. So she. I think she. It was that. It was the relationship of public spending and health, which actually was the thing which really most worried her. And she thought there must be a solution uh, to this. And um, uh, I think she was probably persuaded in the end that that wasn't uh, right. I mean, I always, always took the view that the National Health Service was actually about the best system uh, that there was. Uh, uh, for us, we'd all been, well, most of us had been uh, brought up uh, um, on it. It was well established um, and it uh, um, uh, created uh, a sense of fairness um, and also good health as well. And the trouble, I mean, one mustn't overstate the American experience, but the trouble with the American uh, ex experience is that, you know, money, money can buy anything. We hear, hear in this country, we can, can, if you want to, become a member of a private health scheme, uh, but the government have never remotely, well, in my time, don't it, have never remotely um, uh, uh, come to a position where we are um, um, arguing for an alternative health scheme. So I think Margaret was concerned on that, and then she, I think she was concerned that here was a big nationalized service. I use it, you know, use her, the, the, the expression, not mine. Um, and that it was bureaucratic and it was unmanageable, unmanageable and unmanaged. And uh, therefore there were all kinds of problems uh, inherent in it. And if only you had it uh, differently organized, then uh, um, all would be clear. Uh, that actually didn't work particularly well either. Um, next question relates to the extent to which the, the Scottish office in the Scottish Home and Health Department was free to plough its own, uh, yeah. own furrow. Um, so it's, it's, I think because we don't have a clear factual position to put before you, Lord Fowler, it's a hypothetical question. Um, if, say, Scotland had decided to um, 
take a different course from the department in, on, on big issues such as introducing testing regime earlier um, or taking a different course in terms of the banning of commercial concentrates to the extent that they were used in Scotland. Um, would, would Scotland have been free to take that separate course or, or do you think the department would have tried to put pressure on, on Scotland to um, adopt the department's own approach? Well, the department might have put, probably would have put pressure on to try and get a uniform approach. It doesn't seem to make too much sense to have uh, a, a one system um, in England and another system uh, in Scotland. Um, but um, it, um, it, it, it didn't always work and wouldn't always work. But I think they would try to get a kind of uniform system. But the best example of it uh, not working particularly well um, uh, was the uh, injecting drugs and uh, the fact that um, um, uh, we supplied free needles and they were reluctant to uh, go into free needles. They, were, they did in the end, but that was only, uh, from memory, that was only when Michael Forsyth took over in 1980, well, I can't remember the date, but when he became uh, uh, Secretary of State. To begin with, they were uh, very an antagonistic towards it because they said, look, if you, uh, if you give out these free needles, this is condoning crime and uh, there's no way. And I remember um, uh, a Scot he was actually by this stage an ex-Scottish secretary, uh, but saying at one of our meetings, he said, there's no way known to man that I'm going to support this, this policy. It is just condoning crime. And um, so if you have people taking that view, and for some reason it was very prevalent in Scotland, which also ironically had the worst problem, um, at, uh, that, that, that yes, they could take their, their own view. So it was possible to take their own view, uh, but we didn't particularly like it. Now, you, you, you said in the course of your evidence in relation to Sir Henry Yellowknees that if he'd taken a grip of this thing, we might have had a better picture. And I'm afraid I don't have the references to precisely yeah. what, what point we were talking about then, but we're all, I think we must have been talking about probably 1983 and, and, yeah. and, and AIDS. Um, can you elaborate upon that at all? What, what, what do you think um, Henry Yellowlees could have done that wasn't done? I think it was just a matter of him being rather more hands-on. He was a remote figure. Uh, I didn't see him very often, uh, hardly at all, frankly. Um, um, I don't think anybody else uh, in, on the political side did. There was that quote that uh, Donald has in his book about his view of politicians, which probably expre expresses... Uh, more clearly than I, his view uh, of politicians. So he wasn't he was he wasn't working in the same same way uh, that uh, Donald was working, which was as a partnership um, and working together. They, that wasn't remotely his his um, uh, it seemed to me his his uh, his attitude. He was a traditional um, uh, chief medical officer, traditional um, medic. Um, who regarded um, uh, politics and politicians um, with some distaste, um, uh, which is all very well, except it meant they didn't make many changes, or didn't, you weren't in a position to make many changes, or even look for many changes. Um, so it's quite difficult to put one's hand on it, but he wasn't as involved. Donald was involved right from the, almost right from the beginning uh, in the health department. He did his homework and uh, he involved us all in it, and his enthusiasm uh, and knowledge uh, uh, and involvement uh, uh, took policy through, uh, which was just what we wanted. But that wasn't the case remotely with, uh, um, uh, with Henry, I'm afraid, who was a, who was a, a, a remote person, remote uh, uh, person, and, and perhaps that was ha how CMOs were uh, uh, when he took over. Um Next question is about the issue of stigma relating to, to HIV. Yeah. Um, were, were there any particular steps taken by the department in the 1980s that you can recall to, to combat that stigma? And if so, what were they? Well, um, we, were for, for, we, we were forever uh, uh, doing things to try to uh, combat it. We tried to put uh, uh, our advertising uh, in phrases 
um, which didn't condemn at any stage, um, gay or straight, you know, this was a government advertisement. Well, no one had ever seen anything like that before uh, in this country. I mean, it seems pretty, pretty normal now. Um, I, I, I mean, I give you one other example uh, of, of it. I mean, when I went to uh, the United States, I was uh, going around a ward which was absolutely full uh, of uh, AIDS patients. Absolutely full, young men. Um, and it wasn't my idea, it was the idea of uh, some enterprising um, uh, television reporter there um, who said, would I like to come and shake hands with a, uh, um, an AIDS patient? So I did. I mean, you know, because with all what we were saying was you don't get AIDS from shaking hands or drinking out of the same mug, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that uh, uh, photograph of that got a lot of coverage, actually, in UK, uh, and indeed in the States. Uh, uh, not, a, of course, as much coverage um, as uh, Princess Diana, when uh, uh, she did uh, very much the same thing, I think, at the Middlesex Hospital. Uh, and, uh, but that was a young, beautiful princess uh, doing it, rather than a middle-aged health minister. But, um, uh, I mean, I can't tell you, we, 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 we all, all the ministers, I mean, myself, Tony Newton, we all bend over backwards to actually uh, try and fight stigma. I did debates on the subject. I remember at uh, a young conservative conference, at national conference, facing a hostile motion on the subject with people, uh, with the proposer, um, uh, saying that he was uh, backing um, uh, one of the uh, uh, chief proponents of discrimination. Um, and there was, I thought, a thunderous roar of applause for his speech. But in fact, when it came to the vote, he was heavily outvoted. So if you stood up to it, actually, you know, British public are quite, uh, quite sensible and they will follow the lead. But you had to, you had to try and give a lead. Um, next question is about the Council of Europe recommendation, and it's not about the detailed content of the recommendation. Yeah. It's just about um, um, a, a, a question of process. Yeah. I, I, I asked you about the issue of reliance on US imports and um, um, it, it, the connection with the first part of the recommendation, and, and it's been quite correctly pointed out to me that in terms of that might be true for Scotland, for England, but for example, in terms of Scotland, the position in, uh, was, was rather different in terms of reliance on imported concentrates. Um, um, would you expect the health departments or, or the, the, the territorial departments to have been consulted or to be part of the decision-making process in terms of um, either what recommendations should be made um, or how they should be responded to? From the Council of Europe? In the Council of Europe? Yes. Um, yes, I would have thought they would have been. I think they would have been, and I think that uh, uh, they would have provided the briefing beforehand. Uh, we had someone, uh, we had someone, we had a little section inside the DHSS uh, that uh, did do a European policy, including um, the Council of Europe. Um, and um, no, I think it, no, there was no lack of briefing. But you'd expect there to have been some form of liaison between whichever was the right division um, and the Welsh office, Northern Irish office and Scottish office. Oh, I think so. I think so, yes. That would be my... I mean, I haven't got any no. evidence on that, but that would be my guess. Um, the, the next question, we're nearly, nearly at the end, um, Lord, Lord Fowler, um, it g goes back to the question of no conclusive proof. And as you know, and we've explored it in some detail, you address it in your statement and we explored it with Dr. Wolford, the, the, the qualifying part that was in that original briefing um, didn't then make it into the public statements yeah. in, in their various forms. Um, we, we don't know who took it out, um, um, I, I should say, um, or precisely what the drafting process We're was. We're assuming it was in. I, I mean, I'm assuming it was in. Well, it, it, certainly an early formulation contains it. Um, can, you, can you assist from your own knowledge of the department in understanding whether there were, might have been any reasons for, for, for not including that, that 
that qualification for, and for removing it. I think, that, the that yeah, I think the only reason for removing it uh, would have been that if you did do that, uh, then it could increase concern, it could conceivably increase panic. Um, uh, but I think that that's not, I mean, in my view, that's not a good reason. But if you ask me what the reason is, I would have thought that that was the reason. And, but who, who, who was responsible for that? I, I'm afraid I just don't know. Um, and then um, you, you talked uh, uh, about the importance of, of openness in government yeah. um, and the importance of the government being as open as possible. Did you take any steps, as far as you can recall, when you were at the Department of Health to communicate your support for openness and transparency in relation to matters of, of health and public health to, to, to those working in the department? Um, uh, yes, I think if I was asked, that would be the, the, the point, and I certainly uh, would have uh, made my views known uh, in the relevant cabinet committees that there were. I mean, I was well known as an ex-journalist. I mean, so um, it would come as no, no surprise to anybody that that was my basic view. Um, you've told us about uh, the experience of visiting a children's hospital yeah. early in your years as Secretary of State and seeing the, the babies yeah. with, with whooping cough. Um, do, do you... Um, did, as a matter of fact, did you ever, during the time you were Secretary of State for Health, meet with um, any patients with, with bleeding disorders? Well, I think I did. Uh, I was think, thinking about that. I think I did, but not a specific meeting of that kind. And it, I mean, it was a, it, it, and this was a, it was a, it was a whole problem being a Secretary of State in this massive department. I started with the intent, best intentions of going round. I started uh, with uh, the Children's Hospital. I went uh, to Rampton Special Hospital. Uh, but that's you know two days out of out of your your working uh, your working week, and it just becomes impossible to keep it because you know for the rest of 1982 um, we had um, uh, well, well going going into 1983 um, we had um, a um, was it 82 or 82 whatever 82 uh, we had the Falklands. Um, uh, which required me to just stay where I was um, and go to uh, cabinet meetings. Uh, and that was followed by an industrial dispute, uh, which rather understates uh, its seriousness, which kept me uh, absolutely uh, uh, fully employed uh, until the end of the year. And it was also at a stage when there were demonstrations against uh, conservative ministers was a period of demonstrations in any event. Um, and so uh, it was always a bit, bit counterproductive, actually, uh, paying, uh, paying visits. And I, I think I've, I've reminded myself as you were answering, Lord Fowler, that your statement does make reference to, although you've no independent recollection of it, um, I, I think, a meeting you had probably with a couple, with constituents. Yes, I had two. Who were family members of those who... Exactly right. Two constituents came to see me in Sutton Coalfield. It wasn't the most successful of meetings because uh, once one gets out of the... Uh, I mean, there was no official with me. Um, so it was a meeting just between me uh, me and the two, the two, uh, the, the two constituents. And uh, it probably would have been much more effective um, had it been done uh, with the official coming to Sutton Goldfield um, or them coming to London, uh, tell you, uh, the, 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 that meeting did take place and they expressed their, their concerns. Uh, and then um, um, my, my last question, Lord Fowler, really calls upon your expertise or experience as a parliamentarian. Is there, to your knowledge, a convention that if Parliament has been led by a ministerial statement to expect a particular event, it should be informed if the expectation is not fulfilled. Well, um, um, say that again. Yes, I'm not asking about any particular statement, no. I should say. It's a general question. Is there a convention, that, that, to your knowledge, that if Parliament has been led by a ministerial statement to expect a particular event, 
Parliament should be informed if that expectation is not fulfilled? Um, yes, in one way or another. I mean, it, it most certainly would be, uh, because it, it might not be, if, 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 if it was done in a parliamentary statement, it might not be that it was countered by another parliamentary statement, but it might be countered by a, uh, a parliamentary question, by putting down, a, by uh, uh, having a parliamentary question put down and uh, making it clear that although you had said this in the statement, in fact, it never took, it has never took, taken place, and the reason for that is uh, this and that. I doubt if you'd make a second statement on the subject. Well, you might do, it depends on how serious it was. Uh, but you certainly, you certainly would make it clear if the uh, promise had not been, had not been fulfilled. Um, so those are the questions I'm proposing to ask from those that were suggested on behalf of core participants. I'm just going to see if there's any questions. No, there's none from um, those representing Lord Fowler. Do, do you have questions? Well, I, I, I do. I have a, a couple of questions for you, Lord Fowler. They're, they're both they're rather loosely linked. But the, the first uh, picks up on a question which Council was asking you just towards the end about the no conclusive proof yep. line that was taken. And the absence from it of any qualification, which uh, you thought, and you may well be right, um, I, I've yet to hear all the evidence uh, from departmental officials about it, that the reason was to avoid panic um, and alarm uh, amongst the public. It may, may be said there was uh, a degree of contrast between that approach to communication with the public uh, and the approach which uh, you and the department took uh, shortly after uh, when the tombstone uh, advert and the, that campaign was issued, where although the purpose was not to alarm, but to inform emphatically, it was well understood that a consequence might be alarm, and that would be perhaps uh, no bad thing, I suspect, in the view of, uh, of the department, if I'm right. Um, so between the two, uh, there's a, been a change of approach. And I appreciate that your view uh, would be that communication should always be open uh, and full uh, and informative, as, at least to the best of one's ability. And presumably, that would include telling the public if you just don't know, because information hasn't got to that stage. Yes, I, I agree with, 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 with all that. But what, 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 what stage is there the tipping point, or was there the tipping point, you think, between those two views, looking back on it, between the, the view we dare not risk alarm, assuming that to have been the view, uh, and we don't mind at all if we do, uh, even though that's not the purpose? <laughs> yes. Well, we didn't actually uh, think that when we were doing the, the second one um, that it was quite going to have the impact that it did have. Um, and that came as slightly a surprise uh, uh, to us. It did have uh, a, a major impact. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we had been, been, been struggling <laughs> to get our message uh, into, uh, uh, into the media. Um, and then suddenly it kind of splurged um, um, in that way. But I'm, the only thing I would say about the, the two, the alarm... Um, on the um, advertisements. <clears throat> every advertisement which went out, literally every one which went out, was checked by myself, it was checked by Don Latchison, and it was checked uh, by Tony Newton. So there was absolutely no excuse for getting it wrong. I mean, it was just a fact of life, I'm afraid, or fact of death, I fear, uh, but uh, it, it, HIV was a risk uh, to life um, and uh, um, th that was the message that we were trying to get out it was exactly that was totally um, accurate the other um, uh, the, the contrast um, is, 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 is a piece of what um, um, in my journalistic days would be called ju news management um, they were saying um, well, that might be the case, but it would be rather a bad idea if we let everyone know that. And I'm not in favour of that. I just think you get... I mean, even from the point of view of those people who take that view, um, it often means 
um, 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 that you get into more trouble uh, than, than, than you might otherwise do. But the one was a, 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 an honest approach. The other was a public relations, um, okay, you can, you can, patrician approach as well, rather, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're just the public. We can, we can, we can, uh, we can tell you what's good for you, um, and we shouldn't. Uh, that uh, is a very different uh, uh, kind of approach, and one that personally I don't, uh, I don't, I don't share, and which I th think, I hope, has now gone entirely out of fashion. Although it was, a, I think, a bit in fashion in the 70s and 80s. The the the, the link um, that uh, I would make between that that question, which is really. Uh, addressing the, uh, the the way in which there should be a reaction or maybe a reaction to what is an emerging uh, threat, and it may be said there was a difference between the reaction that was actually taken, albeit you you wouldn't have approved of it, to what was emerging, and later on to what had emerged. But if this inquiry had taken place twenty or so years ago, as you would have wanted. Um, it might have made recommendations which would have affected, or if one would hope improved, uh, the ability of, at least of public health to respond to whatever new threat there might be. Uh, how best would you have seen, uh, or do you see, uh, these um, the processes being adopted which best identify uh, an emerging and serious risk before it becomes an emerged and serious risk? Well, it de I mean, so much, de it, it, it depends a, a bit on the circumstances. Um, but I think the only, uh, the only rule I would make is that you, um, uh, you want to be honest uh, about the position. And if you have a genuine belief genuine honest belief uh, that there is a serious risk emerging, then you should uh, say so, and you shouldn't actually uh, 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 keep that secret. I think you get into, I mean, even if you didn't, don't believe in that, I think if, if you get into much more trouble if you, if you, if you, if you try to, uh, if you try to um, uh, uh, push it under the carpet. Um, so I, I think, you know, honesty and openness is the only thing uh, and I hope that doesn't sound too pie, but I mean, that is about the only way you, you, you can do it. Um, I mean, the other thing, of course, about uh, uh, emerging risks, and I think I suppose in COVID in particular, um, is you've got to decide, you know, what your standpoint is. I mean, it seemed to me a bit of a difficulty with COVID was that, you know, Half of people were saying business is a standpoint, the other half was saying public health is a standpoint. But it makes, it does help matters if you have one standpoint, uh, otherwise people get confused. Would, would your standpoint, I'm talking generally, not yeah. talking specifically yeah. about COVID, uh, though it would apply, um, would your standpoint being that, uh, that the, uh, keeping the public safe is one of the first, if not the first, duty of government? I think it is the first duty of government. And so and I would take public health as being the first. And therefore, everything ought to depend, first of all, upon does this protect or help protect the safety of the public? Exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, finally, um, if this inquiry had, or well, if this inquiry is now in, in uh, process, I, I may make no rec recommendations. I think that's unlikely, but I, I might. But if I do make recommendations, would you have any recommendation you would suggest I would make, which, from your standpoint, given your knowledge of the political realities, uh, would be likely to avoid something like this? I have to put that very generally. Happening again. Yes, happening again is, uh, is difficult, but I think that the more information you get, the quicker and the quicker you get it, then it makes it less likely that things will happen. I mean, my uh, major criticism uh, of what has happened over the last 40 years uh, is it is um, this inquiry is um, 
I won't say too late, but it is, it is very late. I mean, um, your council has been uh, um, urging me for most of uh, two days uh, on issues saying it couldn't it be done earlier. Um, and she's quite right to have done so. Uh, but you might actually make the same uh, uh, criticism of the inquiry itself. That's not, if I was specs, but it's not your fault and it's not council's fault. Um, but, I mean, we have messed about for 40 years uh, before setting up this inquiry. It's been rejected about, I don't know, two or three times, well, no, it must be more than that, uh, times over those years. And then finally, uh, frankly, because of rather dubious for dubious political reasons, I suspect, but I may be wrong about that, uh, it, was, uh, it was brought forward. I think it, it would be at, at the very, it would be very useful if we could uh, say delays of this kind in setting up an inquiry are not acceptable. And it's easy to say that. Uh, uh, but you should also say at the same time that there are, if, you have a, if you're faced with a pandemic as you uh, were as you are today and you were with AIDS, then it should be automatic. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be for a public relations campaign or solicitors or anyone like that to have to uh, work uh, year after year to get the inquiry. It should just come automatically. Um, and the only, the only question would be when it, uh, when it comes. Now, to some extent, I think this is the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the territory on which the government uh, is now on. But it's taken a hell of a long time to, 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 to get there. So the more automaticity you can get into this, uh, the better. I mean, I think there are other questions about the inquiry. I mean, I don't think they should be set up for uh, um, political purposes as well. And, uh, but that takes us into, um, um, that takes us into reform uh, of the public inquiry process. Uh, which I think is beyond my scope at the moment, and certainly beyond the scope um, of uh, uh, this inquiry. I'm not, I'm not at the moment urging an inquiry into the inquiries, uh, but um, uh, I think at some stage we should look at it again and see if there's better things. But uh, you know, from my point of view, I, uh, it's been extremely hard work, uh, um, all this, uh, but from my point of view, everyone has... Um, uh, has helped and has been, uh, uh, um, and, and I've been treated with uh, 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 a courtesy and fairness uh, throughout, and that's, uh, I think, as much as one can expect as a politician. Lord Fowler, is there anything else that you would wish to add? No, I thought I just added that. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Well, I, I, uh, I, I have to particularly thank you, although you make the point that you may be 83 and you could, if this inquiry had been uh, held earlier, have been a, a bit younger. Um, but despite your age, uh, you've shown a vigour, a clarity, uh, and an ability to emphasise what are your independent views before us. Uh, and you, you have, in my uh, view, set out to be helpful to the inquiry, and I thank you for that. Uh, you may not perhaps realise just how helpful uh, it's been to have the unvarnished views uh, of the cabinet minister who was responsible between 81 and 87. Uh, the years of significant interest to this inquiry, who can articulate the pressures and on and the practicalities of decision making in the political field for those who have responsibility for what happened, who can cast light on why, how, uh, and uh, when decisions were made or weren't made by others, uh, and indicate something of the personalities of others who have helped, if in one way or the other, frame what happened or what didn't happen. So can I just thank you very much for that. You have our appreciation. Thank you very much indeed. That's very kind of you indeed. Thank you. Mm. So that's, that's it for today. Um, we obviously will be coming back in later hearings to government action and yes. government decision-making. 
but we turn to Moro to, to start looking at material relevance to pharmaceutical companies. Yes. So tomorrow at 10 o'clock, pharmaceutical companies.